Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So I got a lot of information I need to cover with you today. Things have escalated rapidly within the last 24 hours and you need to know about it. So we got a lot of open source intel that we need to share. I can't get through it all in the first minute, so you're gonna have to bear with me for at least 15 minutes so I can get through this stuff. Now I first off wanna say if you've placed an order at CanadianPreparedness.com, we are working around the clock to meet an unprecedented demand right now. We know we're behind. Some people have placed orders two, three weeks ago. We're still catching up. We've had some staff shortages, but rest assured, it is our top priority. It's the only thing, it's keeping me up at night, put it that way, to get you guys uh, the stuff you need before all hell breaks loose. And I will ride it out personally, Kevin Costner, postman style, if I have to, through some post-apocalyptic hellscape. If it comes to that, I will get you your gear, I promise. Now, I do want to say that um, things are not looking good. Things are just not looking good. Things are escalating rapidly, okay? We have so many developments in the last 24 hours, from sanctions being put on China, to diplomats being expelled, to uh, strike groups moving into position, and that's something I, I really think is going to be the cornerstone of this video, is talking about some strike groups, which have been uh, aircraft carrier strike groups, which have been moved in, into position by the US and the Mediterranean. But we're gonna talk about that in a second. So I just got off a call with Dr. Peter Pry. We're gonna be releasing that video on Saturday. It's talking all about, he goes into great depth about nuclear vulnerabilities, his whole take on the Russia-Ukraine situation, a very, very unique perspective that you're not going to hear anywhere else. He has a theory about what the Russians are doing right now and that they might be potentially uh, baiting us into a, a bigger, bigger conflict. Because as many of you guys know, they haven't been seemingly deploying a lot of the, the big weapons yet. And uh, he has a theory as to why they haven't done that yet. And you guys are just going to have to wait till Saturday because this, he blew my mind with some of the theories that he put forth about what could potentially be going on right now. Now, okay, so we just got the word that uh, European gas markets are up 25%. Okay, the cost of gas has risen 25% on the news that Russia is only going to be accepting payments for their gas in rubles. One more blow to the US dollar, okay? So this is gonna have drastic repercussions. Obviously the price of gas was already sky high. Gas is used for everything. Therefore, you can expect that all commodity prices are going to rise on the heels of this. The price of oil is up today once again, far off its record at 135, but I believe it's around 120 right now at the time of this video. So things are escalating there. We are going to see some major, major food shortages this year as a result of the high cost of natural gas. Russia is one of the primary exporters of potash, which of course is used to make fertilizer. And uh, the price of uh, potash stocks in Canada, because I live in a province, Saskatchewan, that has one of the highest uh, potash outputs in the world and uh, those stocks are just going through the roof because they know what's coming they know that we are going to be relying on our our own natural resources from here on in as a result of this decoupling so we have the Russian cyber attack threat which is in the news now the cyber attack threat is interesting because you know you would have thought that Russia would have pushed back economically first before they uh, they started doing the cyber attacks and I still think they will. I think that the US intelligence and the State Department is just trying to cover all their bases uh, so not to be caught off guard. But that's not the biggest news at, by a long shot, okay? We got diplomats being expelled from Belarus. We got uh, China militarization. We got sh sanctions slapped on China, which is uh, basically rattling that whole hornet's nest. Everything is just blowing up in the last 24 hours. We have uh, talks of Poland potentially getting involved in uh, Western Ukraine. So let's just let's just try to cover it all, okay, guys. And this is only skimming the surface of the news <laughs> that we have to report today. We got 10 million people fleeing from their homes in the Ukraine. 3.5 million refugees out of the country right now. 10 million people have been forced to leave their homes. Think about that. That is just uh, unfathomable, okay. And that is going to create. A lot of disruption in Europe uh, according to my sources it's already starting to you know th there's a bit of a honeymoon period with the refugees where you know the population is trying to help and I think that that period is probably going to come to an end soon as uh, it leads to further economic destabilization and all the countries that are accepting what's going on in Ukraine they know it and that's why they're going to take a more active role in the in the war 
And when that happens, of course, that's when things could potentially get nuclear. Now, um, Russia has been officially uh, condemned for war crimes by the U.S. government. I believe it was, uh, I, th I think it was Blinken who came out and said that. So that's an escalation right there, a point of escalation. We have a point of escalation with Russia being sanctioned by the U.S. Uh, for supposedly the Uyghur genocide that is happening there. But we all know that, uh, you know, they had plenty of opportunity to do that in the past. I think they did it once in 2020 and they haven't done it again since. So we know that this is on the heels of China pledging their commitment to their alliance with Russia. So clearly that's what this is about. And that, of course, is going to uh, basically provoke a response from China and which could potentially intensify things really rapidly. We have China militarizing the Southeast China Sea on uh, a strip of islands. I can't remember exactly what the islands are called, but you can look at it on Google Earth. Everything's like blacked out and uh, you could see that they're preparing for something. Is it a gateway into Taiwan's back door, you know, to, to try to take Taiwan from both sides? Possibly. It's still pretty far from Taiwan, so if they were going to stage some sort of offensive from there, I'm not sure how that would be militarily strategic or how that might go, but that's something to consider. Um, something that a lot, not a lot of people know, before we get into the meat and potatoes of this video, I didn't know this, but Russia has very little debt uh, compared to a lot of countries. I think their debt to GDP, GDP ratio is like 20%. Whereas, you know, the U.S. owes more than their GDP. So they're, I think, in the whole like 30 trillion. And that's just what's conventionally known about. I'm sure it's it's a lot worse than that. So that's just a little factoid for you. You know, they don't have debt. They have this surplus of cash that they were waiting to use as a war chest. They're only going to be able to access about half of it. And uh, that, of course, is going to create problems in itself because that's basically another act of war by the US. The US is getting very, very close to basically declaring all out war with Russia. Uh, another useless factoid, before we jump into the meat and potatoes of this video, I just want you guys to know that uh, the Arctic is 30 degrees, centi 30 degrees Celsius warmer than average within the past week. That is just crazy. So like I said, get ready for a wild ride this year while all this stuff is going on. And uh, something to attest to the claim I made in a recent video, a lot of the uh, Russians who are on board with some of the, the climate stuff have totally bailed from that right now. We have a disagreement right now with Russia and Japan over these islands. If some of you guys don't know, Russia and Japan have a long history of warring with one another. So we potentially see another war theater flaring up in that region. But to get to the meat and potatoes of this video, U.S. Navy deploys carrier strike group in, Medi in Mediterranean to implement Ukrainian no-fly zone if Biden gives the order. So they are getting ready, guys. They are getting ready now. A lot of people think that this is just going to end in disaster because uh, according to Dr. Pry, he thinks that we are drastically underestimating Russian capabilities. I have other people who have uh, informed me that, you know, something like this, like this strike group could be easily taken out by a tactical nuke, but let's hope it doesn't escalate to that point. Now, the United States operates 11 carrier strike groups has, and has deployed them repeatedly ac across the globe over the decades in a show of force against mostly smaller, militarily weaker nations. U.S. forces in the Mediterranean operate under the 6th Fleet headquarters in Naples, Italy, and have a combined strength of up to 40 ships and 175 aircraft. The USS Truman Carrier Strike Group has been deployed to the Mediterranean with Secretary Carlos del Toro saying its mission includes deterring Russia and implementing a potential no-fly zone over Ukraine. Should President Biden give the order to establish one? There are numerous Russian ships and subs in the Mediterranean today, and that's why it's important for NATO to have an equal presence to deter them. The only thing that Putin understands is this kind of strength. So this is a major escalation in my mind. Um, I don't know where this strike group was prior to this, so you know it could be potentially overblown, but I think just the fact that they're mentioning strike group and Russia in the same sentence is, is fairly significant. The current tensions between Russia and NATO over Ukraine's 
aren't the first time the U.S. has had to deploy a carrier strike, strike group in the Mediterranean as a show of force against Moscow in spring of 2014 in the wake of the victory of the U.S. and EU-backed maiden coup in Kiev and tensions between Russia and NATO over the fate of Crimea. Washington deployed the Nimitz-class carrier, the George H.W. Bush, near the peninsula off Turkey. And as we know, this situation is a lot worse than 2014. Needless to say, this is a full-on war with Ukraine, not just the Crimea situation. Now, there's also been a rapid deterioration in Russian-Poland relations in recent hours as staff at the Russian embassy in Warsaw uh, destroyed secret documents and prepared to leave the country. So I believe they're expelling like 45 diplomats. Now, that sounds a little sensational, destroying secret documents. Uh, this is something which is quite typical when you have diplomats leave a place or are expelled from a place apparently they were uh they were accused of espionage and which you know seems kind of obvious at this point um but usually this is the first step this is what we've seen in ukraine months prior to this so i think that this is a bad harbinger for what might potentially be coming in terms of poland's involvement in the conflict uh, what else do we got here A lot of this information is open source intel, like I say, nothing nothing classified. Uh, Poland's counterintelligence service, ABW, said today it had located, located 45 Russian diplomats suspected of being spies. Adding to it, had asked the foreign ministry to deport them. So they compiled that list and they deported those people. Now there's also some talk about Belarus getting involved it seems that they are posturing to make a move forces deployed on the border with belarus nato forces are deployed just three kilometers from polish but belarusian border while an a a wax boeing e3 sentry constantly flies to the border with ukraine monitoring the airspace now peter pry was telling me today that they have deployed bombers to this region he doesn't know what they're armed with are they armed with nukes we don't really know at this point um, you can see though on flightradar.com that there's a lot of military planes uh, flying around all the time uh, russian media reported that nato countries are launching a new challenge along the border with neighboring belarus where they where they're deploying dozens of armored vehicles artillery tanks to launch the Bull Run 18 exercise announced by the Polish Ministry of Defense a few days ago. We're going to see a lot of these exercises in the coming days and weeks. And a lot of it, of course, is going to be guys just to increase readiness without explicitly stating so. The appearance of these forces just three kilometers from the border with Belarus shows that maybe NATO is preparing the ground for new challenges and is probably preparing to send peacekeeping forces to Ukraine you know it's going to be interesting to see you know if the UN does get involved in, in some capacity what what response that is going to to yield uh, Poland is preparing to open a second front in Ukraine Russian media reports that under the pretext of NATO peacekeeping mission a mild occupation of the territories of western Ukraine is being prepared which war which Warsaw considers do to belong historically to Poland. A little tongue-tied today. So we definitely see that there is a potential now for this thing to to spread beyond the borders of Ukraine. And uh, this thing is escalating. It's not slowing down. All this talk of peace talks has basically gone out the window in a lot of ways. And Zelensky is, is sweating right now because he knows that the pressure is on. There is clearly been some ground made by the russians in this whole thing uh, whether we want to admit it or not that's just probably the case and we should probably err on the side of caution and continue to overestimate their cap capabilities and not underestimate and to give you the gist of peter price theory that he's going to propose in this video that we're going to release on saturday is that the russians are reserving some of their best equipment because they know that this thing is going to escalate well beyond the capabilities of Javelin and Stinger missiles. Okay, he knows that this, or they know that this is going to be something which is going to involve other 
countries which are more capable. And as the art of war dictates, appear weak when you're strong. And that he claims that that's what they're trying to do, is they're trying to pretend like they're weak, pretend like they're incompetent, using all this old military equipment in order to maybe uh, bait NATO into fighting with them because, you know, and then they're going to eventually bust out the big guns. Now, we've seen some of these displays of superior technological force with the hypersonic missiles, uh, some of the cruise missile strikes, and some of the precision uh, strikes from, like, drones and things of that nature, as well as, you know, their their use of thermobaric bombs, which I think are illegal. Um, of course, there's a constant talk of uh, chemical and biological threats. We don't know if that's going to be genuine. Is it going to be a false flag? There's just so much fog of war going on right now. It's uh, It's very interesting to know that in it, the information age where we have so many cameras, so much means of acquiring intelligence that it's become harder to truly discern what is actually going on in the front than prior to having any of this stuff. And that's because it can be equally used to confuse and disinform as much as it can be used to inform. So it's very important that you keep an open mind with this situation because we don't know what's happening. The only people who really know what's happening are the people who are fighting on the ground. But we can see, we got to remember, base base your projections and your predictions on what you can see. We see people being expelled now from the uh, Russians being expelled from Poland. We're seeing that happening. Okay, we're seeing strike groups move into position. Does this, and we're seeing uh, cities being bombarded now in a much more indiscriminate manner. Does this look like some, a situation which is de-escalating to you? Okay, do not look to the markets for guidance on this. They're going to be the last to know. And uh, do not look to the mainstream media for how this is going to escalate because this thing could blow up really fast. We've seen what has happened in the last 24 hours. I wouldn't be surprised that if by next week, China and, and Russian, um, sorry, China and U.S. relations just fell through a floor and just, you know, like things are happening so fast now that that could happen and that we could start to see a, a sanction war between countries. Russia hasn't even really hit back on that on that front yet with respect to, you know, withholding their natural resources. They only have today, which is a very crafty kind of in-between way of uh, continuing to ship their much needed natural gas that Europe relies on without having to make uh, concessions. Okay. So this is going to have global implications on the markets. And uh, we are in for a very, very interesting ride this year. My God. And that's why we are working our butts off to try to get you guys your gear. And uh, like I say, we're seeing unprecedented demand right now. Uh, there's certain things which they're just not going to be in stock anymore. Uh, children's gas masks are totally sold out. The only children's version of gas mask we have are full like bubble head type masks, which are good, but they're more expensive. And um, another variant of the CM7M, which is a gas mask used by uh, more military and combatants. And you can get the smaller version of that one, which will fit some children or smaller people. And uh, the reason why it's uh, military is because you can actually use an optic with it. So if you have to use a gun, not all gas masks allow you to do that. Although, honestly, the, the majority of the majority of people are never going to have to do that. But um, if you're somebody who is military, militia, what have you, then, you know, that might be something you want to think about. Uh, Geiger counters are pretty much gone. There's none of that left. Um, I think Mira Safety had... had had a windfall of some more Thyrosafe. They got like the last Thyrosafe available. And like I said, you don't need Thyrosafe. You can use uh, potassium iodide, um, not potassium iodide. You can use iodine. We did a whole video on that with Dr. Joe a few weeks ago. So yeah, you got time now, but things are escalating rapidly, man. And uh, it is 15 degrees above normal here today. I'm in a t-shirt and uh, it's going to be an interesting year. We did get more moisture this year, so I think that's going to uh, mitigate the drought a little bit. But it goes back up into the sky. like it, It's already bone dry in a lot of places, which is so strange. Um, 
anyways, uh, all those things combined means that we're going to see a, a drastic increase in food prices. And now they're talking about stimulus checks to <laughs> increase the price of, um, or to help people offset the increase in gas prices. Guys, where do you think that money comes from? It doesn't fall from the sky. I mean, it does fall from the sky for them, but you know, it's just going to increase inflation. This is it, man. This is the end of the U.S. dollar, I do believe. It's still going to be there, just like the British pound is still there, but it's not going to be the global reserve currency, and it's going to have huge, huge repercussions on the U.S. economy, and we're in store for a major, major restructuring of just everything in the next 10 years if we're lucky enough to avert nuclear disaster, which is certainly... Uh, something which is becoming less and less likely by the day. But let's keep our fingers crossed. Let me know what you think in the comments section below. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe if you enjoy the video. Canadian Prepper out.